The Karokan Defense, Room Temperature IQ, or a Crippling Lack of Female Attention. Tonight we investigate the source of all your frustration as an intermediate chess player, sharpen your tactical awareness, and teach you how to actually play the Karokan Defense, by analyzing three high-level games with only one thing in mind, pawns. When to push them, when to trade them, and when to sacrifice them. But first, let's take a look at the basics of the Karokan Defense. E4 is the most common first move in chess, and the reply C6, the Karokan Defense, is one of the best openings to master the art of pawn play. Because according to classical principles, the opening is a stage where both players fight ruthlessly for central control, and the best pieces for that mission, are the pawns. D4 is the most common move you will see. And if left unchecked, white will play moves like C4, F4 and have total central domination. But why is that important? Exactly. Think of it this way, if none of black's pieces can occupy these central squares, how are they ever going to get to white's king? Or worse, if white's pieces can freely occupy these squares, what gruesomeness will happen to black's king? Something very similar to what would happen if you try to escape the friend zone, by public display of affection. That's why d5 is the most important move in the Karokan defense, an immediate challenge to white's center. How white responds to this thrust, will determine the pawn structure for the rest of the game. If white pushes, it leads us to the advanced pawn structure, and the deadly ideas we will study in the first game. But if white captures on d5, it will lead us to one of the two most important pawn structures in all of chess. So if you can stay till the end of this video, you will appreciate why pawns truly are the soul of chess. But more importantly, you will learn how to use them as a deadly weapon, regardless of the chess opening you play, English or Spanish. E4C6 is the Karokan defense, and this brilliant 2200 rated Lee chess player with a sketchy username, is about to put on a masterclass on how to break down pawn chains. After D4 D5, 3 E5 is the advanced variation of the Karo Khan, and Black quickly attacks the center with the move C5. This is Karo Khan opening principle. Some players prefer to develop their pieces first, control this square, and then strike at white center with the C pawn. But this seemingly premature pawn thrust, works just as well. Because if white captures this pawn, after moves like knight C6 and E6, he will have a very tough time holding on to these two pawns. In fact, up to 2200 rating level, the move C3 is played overwhelmingly. The idea is to keep white center intact by taking back on D4 with the C3 pawn, protecting E5. But that creates a unique pawn structure in which the square D4, will be the focal point of black's early middle game plans. The move is knight C6 putting pressure on D4, and white responds with the move knight F3, but bishop G4 pins the knight to the queen. The threat is simple. If white were to play a normal looking move like H3, a blunder, bishop takes F3, forces the queen away from her original square, and the party on the d4 square begins. Takes takes and knight takes, destroys white's center, wins a pawn, and threatens the queen. But white still has to be careful here. In chess, it is very easy to go from an unpleasant position, to dead lost. Because for some reason, the most natural response to this threat for a lot of players, is to instantly threaten the knight with a move like queen e3, after which, a simple knight c2, triggers an instant bowel movement. But white was a 2000 plus rated player, so after bishop g4, he responded correctly with bishop e2, leaving the queen on d4 duty. Black plays e6, locking the center, a very important Karo Khan move. Because while white is one move away from king's safety, black's king on the other hand, is stuck at the center until further notice. So if the center was to be opened, black would be in serious trouble. That's the one downside of the Karo Khan. Every chess opening has a downside, except for one, my own creation, the Nimzo Zimbabwean defense. Undefeated. But hey, this is a video about the Karo Khan, which fortunately, I'm somewhat of an expert in. This knight belongs on f5, and the queen is great on a square like b6. All pieces focusing on the key d4 square. That's the advanced Karo Khan plan, but mind you, it must be executed while keeping an eye out for your king still stuck at the center. White castles, and the knight begins its journey to f5. But h3 was played by white, a sneaky move. Because if the bishop retreats to f5, it's in the way of the knight's mission. But if it retreats to h5, knight f5 will be met by the devastating g4, forking the bishop and the knight. So black has only one logical move in this position. And if a tiny voice on the inside has been screaming, about these two pawns just staring at each other without capturing. That's the 100 rated ADHD at the back of your brain. Try meditation. It will also cure your insatiable thirst for Samoan men. Canalizing. Anyway, takes 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 takes, and now, it should be clear why Black is focusing all his energy on d4. This is what we call a backward pawn weakness in chess. 
It's a pawn that can never be protected by another pawn. But if white can somehow hold on to it and maintain this structure, what does he have in return? Kingside space advantage, the bishop pair, and moves like f4 f5 leading to an inevitable attack on black's castled king. In this game however, queen b6 proved to be an annoying threat for white to deal with. Bishop e3 defends the threat, but creates another weak point in white's position. That's the art of attack. Two annoying jabs to the body, a feint, and then a clean right hand to the chin. Your grandma will never touch your food again. Queen takes b2 and after the only move knight d2, you may be tempted to capture the d4 pawn. And you will often get away with it. But remember what I said, execute your plan but always keep your king's safety in mind. This is one of those times, because after knight takes d4, moves like rook b1 and queen a4 check, you will die, with a belly full of pawns. So black played knight f5, and after rook b1, takes and rook takes, I personally would not feel very comfortable with my king at the center. But black had calculated everything to a t, bishop b4, and his king is one move away from safety. White played rook c7, trying to be as much of a nuisance as he can to black, but he missed a minor detail. Most players would be worried about their king's safety, or thinking about their knight in this position, but knight e3 by this brave 2200. A brilliant move. Because it has removed a defender of the knight on d4, but it also threatens the queen and the rook if it's not addressed. A long series of captures occurs at the end of which, white has a painful realization. If he captures this knight, he will likely lose all his central pawns. This is why you must train your calculation skills in chess. Above a certain rating level, it is almost unacceptable that white does not see this, before playing rook c7. The engine suggests the move king f2, accepting your mistake, and holding on to your central pawns. But if you know anything about human beings, you know that we would rather lose the game, than admit we made a mistake. That is why people will still vote for You know what, let's not go there. I need all the likes I can get. Rook takes was played stubbornly, but after these captures. What we see, is the result of a well-executed pawn-focused Karokan strategy. White's pawn formation went from this beauty, to this. Rook e1 was played, protecting e5, and finally on move 21, we see the move castles by black. It takes a bit of bravery to play the Karo Khan, but if you execute the plans well, you are usually rewarded with simple and straightforward positions like these ones, where all you have to do is just push your pawns, make 5 queens, and win. High-level chess knowledge I'm delivering to you from the thick jungles of Zimbabwe, after wiping my ass with a dead baboon. And the next game is just as instructive, if not more. e4 c6, d4 d5 is the Karo Khan defense. But in this position, instead of the advance e5, and all the ideas surrounding the d4 square, the 1800 on the white pieces went for pawn takes pawn, the exchange variation of the Karo Khan defense. A totally legit way to play. White's only problem, was that on the black pieces, was my favorite YouTuber, a 2400 plus international master, who knows exactly what to do in these exchange Karo Khan structures. And what happens next, is exactly what would happen, if any of you guys ever challenged me to a game in the comments. I'm a different breed. I don't mind unleashing the Nimzo Zimbabwean on my subscribers. Anyway, pawn takes pawn is played by Alex, and in this position, white can do one of two things with the pawn on c2. c3, like what was played in the game, protecting the d4 square, or white can play the explosive c4, leading to an insane pawn structure, which we will study in the final game. Black develops his knights first and then his bishop to f5, all in line with Karo Khan principles. After he plays e6, a key Karo Khan move, we will have what is called the Carlsbad pawn structure. It is characterized by this 4 versus 2 pawn battle on the queen side. The plan here is in three stages. Stage 1 involves pushing these two pawns all the way up to these four pawns, and then in stage 2, initiate trades which will leave white with two weak queenside pawns. The final stage of the plan, will be to use your minor and heavy pieces to attack these pawns, after which, if all goes well, you will be rewarded with a simply winning endgame. The chess name for this plan, is the minority attack. A 200 plus year old chess strategy, that has nothing to do with law enforcement or anything like that. Anyway, this is the position we are currently studying. Lots of minor and heavy pieces on the board. But now you know that the pawns, are the backbone of all chess plans. Bishop d3, and the following move by Alex, is why it's not always a good idea to study master level games on your own. g6. Why? The simple plan would have been takes takes, e6, and then kickstart the minority attack. Alex is an international master, he knows this. But he is trying to entice white to capture this bishop, opening up the g-file, which will, 
in a few moves, be used by this rook in a surprise kingside attack. Sneaky, but fortunately for us, white rejects the offer by castling. After queen c7, he rejects it again by playing the move rook e1. So Alex goes back to the original plan of the minority attack. And after a few moves we get to this position. Alex has played a6, preparing b5. White's pieces are also locked and loaded for an assault on black's kingside. But look at this marvelous defensive formation. The battle lines have been drawn, kingside attack, versus minority attack. a4 is played by white, delaying b5, but there is no stopping the minority attack. Rook b8 and b5, is only a matter of time. Knight takes e5 is played by white. And even if it's not threatening anything yet, if there is one piece you never want to have just lingering in your position, it's a knight. So, knight takes e5, but the recapture by white, is somewhat surprising. Rook takes e5. Your tactical senses must be tingling right about now. This rook is in the path of the bishop, and a move like knight e4, traps the rook and opens it to the bishop's line of fire. But is it a good move? This is where chess tactics meet chess intuition. Calculation meets understanding. It might not seem like it, but this dark squared bishop is one of your best pieces when firing a queenside pawn storm of this nature. Because say in a few moves, the minority attack has landed, you have a position like this, and you want to pick off these weak pawns with your minor pieces. That's when this bishop comes alive. But that's not all. It's also the glue holding this entire defensive structure together. So if it were to disappear, and your opponent has a dark squared bishop of his own, it takes losing a ton of games like this to learn that gaining an exchange in the short term may bite you in the long term but. So Alex plays knight d7, and after the rook retreats, b5 is played, triggering the minority attack. Takes takes, and this move will always create some type of pawn weakness. A weakness on which black will focus all his energy in the middle game. And when it's captured, holding on to this one isolated pawn will prove to be a very tough assignment. Rook c8 is played by Alex with very clear intentions, but white plays rook a3, protecting his weakness. A blunder. Can you think of a simple move, that will displace this rook from the third rank? Yes, bishop f8, and this pawn is gone. But Alex did not play it. Why? In his video, link down below, he says he wanted to teach us how to win these positions, if the opponent made good moves instead. I'm assuming that's a better use of his time, than finding a girlfriend for example, but hey, to each their own. Queen c4 offers a trade and binds the weakness to its square, a concept you'll appreciate more in the next game. Because if your opponent has a pawn weakness, you do not want to allow him to push it, and trade it for one of your healthy pawns. So if you plug a piece in the square in front of it, while you mobilize your attackers, you are playing chess well above 2000 rating level. Queen d2, white declines that trade, but rook b3 offers another trade and cuts off the rook's view of the pawn. Take takes, and look at the pressure mounting on this backward pawn. Knight f2 defends, but black has another attacker on the way. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. That's the motto of the Karo Khan. No flamboyant rook sacrifices, no fancy tactics, just a simple plan, executed with machine-like coldness. In the following moves, black maintains pressure on the c3 pawn, while maneuvering his pieces and creating multiple little threats, forcing white to respond. That's how these positions are won. Because between trying to hold onto this pawn, and responding to all your annoying little threats, at some point, they all blunder. Knight a4, and the pawn is gone. The rest is a matter of converting this endgame advantage to a win, which admittedly, is easier said than done. And if you were wondering, it's also exactly what makes this guy, arguably the greatest chess player of all time. Playing the white side of this endgame against Magnus Carlsen, is a nightmare of epic proportions. He has an unnatural ability to play 30 correct moves in a row in these positions. Accumulate small positional advantages for every tiny mistake you make. And when you get to such a position where, you need to switch to tactics to finish the game. Magnus saw that tactic, 10 moves ago. And credit to Alex, he saw it too. Bishop f4 check and it's lights out. Because if king takes, then d2, and there is no stopping this pawn from queening. A brilliant example of a minority attack in the Carlsbad pawn structure. But this. In the form of a game between a 2400 and a 2700 on Lee Chess, is the isolated queen pawn structure. I feel like I should be making you guys pay for this knowledge. But anyway, y'all know the best way to show this video some love. Takes Takes, is the exchange variation of the Karo Khan, but unlike the previous game with c3 and the Carlsbad pawn structure, this player goes for c4, the Panov attack. The trick here, is you don't want to capture this pawn until this bishop moves. Can someone explain why in the comments, and I'll pin it for everyone to see. 
The knights are developed with this central tension in mind. Until after bishop e6, a critical move asking white to resolve the central situation, the d-pawn is captured. The bishop recaptures, leaving white with an isolated d-pawn. The source of the greatest debate in chess middle game theory. The question is, is it a weakness, or is it a strength? The closest answer to the truth, is that it is a weakness, if and only if black can fix it to the square, trade pieces, and then focus on capturing it in the endgame. But it can be a strength for white if, after captures captures. He can find a way to push it, and open up the position for his very active bishops and knights to maneuver, and create problems for black. Those are the two plans at battle, in isolated d-pawn positions. Bishop e2 is played preparing castles, and e6, an important Karo Khan move in general, is extra important in this line, because it stakes claim on the square in front of the target pawn, making sure it doesn't move, but also opening a path for the bishop to be developed. Both sides develop their pieces until after a3, black plays rook d8, making his intentions clear. White was a decent player as well, so he puts his rook where it belongs, that is, on an open file. After a6, he uses a combination of the rook and this bishop, to remove the queen from the path of his pawn to d5. But this move is still unplayable. It's two attackers versus four defenders, white would just be giving away the pawn. So he plays queen e2, connecting his rooks and preparing to swing this one, to assist efforts at the center of the board. But again, black plugs this d5 square with a knight. And the next few moves, are a mixture of black putting more pressure on this pawn, and also fighting for control of the d5 square. Until after queen d8, black has created a special piece formation known as Alec Hines gun, aimed at the d4 target. The knight is also aimed at the target, but it's four attackers versus four defenders. White is holding on to his pawn marvelously. His problem however, is that he cannot make any progress. He is stuck defending this weakness and can never hope for a win, unless black makes a mistake. So in the next few moves, white sets a nasty trap. Queen e2, and now this pawn has three defenders, versus black's four attackers. Can it be captured? Pause the video and try to find the sneaky move white was banking on. Chess is a brutal sport. You can play the opening like a book, follow your middle game plan like a machine, and then, a series of captures followed by a nasty surprise move. Queen e5 check, king moves, and your opponent emerges a whole piece up from the whole ordeal. Brutal. It's the equivalent of being a good Christian your whole life. Honest, God-fearing, kind, spiritual, forgiving. But on your deathbed, you can't help but lust after your caregiving nurse. And that's enough to send you straight to hell. Like, is that a good example? I don't know. But black was a 2600, so he wasn't going to fall for that sneaky trick. He played queen f6 instead, and now this pawn is about to fall, because the nasty queen e5 move is no longer playable. White is forced to bring back his queen to protect the pawn. Psychologically, this is a nightmare position for white. Black wasn't Magnus Carlsen, but he did grind his opponent down, by maintaining pressure on the weakness, and maneuvering his pieces, creating multiple annoying little threats all over the board, until white made a mistake. Knight d2. After which knight e5 makes use of the pin on the pawn, to remove a defender of the pawn. And then jumps to c6, making it 3 attackers versus 0 defenders. The pawn drops, and black immediately starts seeking trades. Because the fewer pieces there are on the board, the stronger your pawn advantage becomes, and the less likely you are, to get surprise mated by your opponent. Surprise mated? Tell me why that sounds like a crime. Anyway, after queen takes and takes, this is now a pure rook endgame, and black starts showing master level technique, something you can only attain after 10,000 plus hours of pure chess focus, zero entertainment, zero females, or in your case, zero men. Because take this position for example. The only way to win, is for black to move this rook, but do so without losing this pawn. Impossible. Right? Watch this. F4 sacrifices the first pawn, and then G3 sacrifices yet another pawn. The intention is to just go G2 and G1 queen. But after takes and rook H1, guess what? This pawn is untouchable. Because check, and the rook is gone. White resigns. A brilliant end to a very informative chess video. But if you think you've mastered pawn structures, think again. In our next video, we'll explore the Bothanic Triangle. A deadly pawn structure that can turn your games upside down. Leave a like, and let's meet on the other side.